Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we're just getting in now to Lesson 2 in a series on the Book of Jeremiah. Now, you might not have spent a lot of time in the Book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a little bit heavy, but we're going to find a lot of interesting and challenging questions in this book. This is lesson number two for October 10 of 2015, entitled, The Crisis Within and Without. See if you can guess what that implies. Before we begin, of course, we always like to ask the Lord to guide us, the Holy Spirit to be with us, and we'd ask you to bow your heads with us as we pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, it is always a privilege to come together and sit with friends and talk about you. Forgive us where we may have failed you, but help us now as we open your book that we, we may get to know you better, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't think I have to tell anyone who has a little familiarity with the Old Testament that the history of Israel from the exodus to the exile in, in Babylonian captivity is a very sad one. Uh, they learned from, they seemed to go from one crisis to another, and those crises started right there, almost at the foot of Mount Sinai. And the general trend, of course, you know, is downward. Um, and here's Jeremiah now, coming along about, probably born around 640 BC. The first conquest of Jerusalem was 605 BC, so Jeremiah would have been about 35 years old. And uh, it, was, it was just rough. He, he lived through every single one of those conquests, all three of them, uh, when Babylon came and, and, and conquered Jerusalem. So, and sieges, I should mention those. I mean, the sieges were so bad that people were eating their children. Um, but there were several factors why, and this is, of course, what we want to talk about today, why that decline, why that slide, and we'll see if we could get an idea what some of those reasons were. Unfortunately, it turns out that the people who were involved seemed to be unwilling to admit that they ever had any problems at all. So we turn to places like Judges 2, and we're going to see how all this got started. Look at Judges 2, starting with verse 1. The angel of the Lord went from Gilgal to Bochum and said to the Israelites, I took you out of Egypt and brought you to the land that I promised to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. You must not make any covenant with the people who live in this land. You must tear down their altars. And of course, those would be fertility cult symbols or places to worship. But you have not done what I told you to. You have done just the opposite. So I tell you now that I will not drive these people out as you advance, they will be your enemies, and you will be trapped by the worship of their gods. When the angels had said this, all the people of Israel began to cry, and that is why the place is called Bochum, which of course means weeping. There they offered sacrifices to the Lord. Joshua sent the people of Israel on their way, and each man went to take a possession of his own share of the land, and of course they had conquered parts of it, and they had sort of parceled that out. As long as Joshua lived, the people of Israel served the Lord, and after his death they continued to do so, as long as the leaders were alive who had seen for themselves all the great things that the Lord had done for Israel. So the first question I want to ask all of you is, okay, so some gray-haired guy, I mean, look at me, gray-haired guy, some gray-haired guy is still alive who remembers coming, you know, maybe coming out of Egypt when he was really young, uh, and all the plagues and all that kind of stuff, why would that keep all of them from sinning? Because he had a lot to tell them and remind them. Okay. And didn't mind telling them either. Yeah, that may be true. The Lord's servant Joshua, son of Nun, died at the age of 110. He was buried in his own part of the land at Timnasserah, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gerash. The whole generation also died, and the next generation forgot the Lord and what he had done for Israel. Now, that seems incredible to me. I mean, we're one generation away from the plagues in Egypt, the Mount Sinai experience, and you forgot? Then they the people. Really, they really have good teachers. 
yeah. the people who want to listen, what can yeah. be done for them? I mean, they're, they're not going to learn to do the right thing just by living and, 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 and breathing and so forth. They have to be taught. Well, then the people of Israel sinned against the Lord and began to serve the Baals. And basically, I'm, I, I'm not gonna, I don't have time to read on to this, but what you'll find out is they would turn against the Lord. Then God would say, okay, if that's what you want, you're on your own. Then they would get into all kinds of trouble. And then they go back, and, oh, please, Lord, forgive us, forgive us, take us back. So God says, okay. And of course, in that process, when God turned away from them, what did he call that? His anger. His anger or his wrath. Yeah. And his anger and wrath here, in verse uh, you got verse 11 up there. You go down a little bit farther here. Yeah. They provoked the Lord to anger, mm -hmm. and he gave them over to plunderers. Mm -hmm. He gives you, that's God's wrath, is get, let you go. You yeah. bent on leaving, he'll let you go. This is one of the clear spots in Scripture about that, because it happens again and again and again and again and again in Judges 2 and 3. You might want to look at that if you, if you have a chance. But when they remained faithful to God, they did well. But when they turned away from God, there was all kinds of problems. We, I mean, everybody knows that they turned away from God right, in the, right th out there in the desert, and they end up having to do, what, 40 years wandering around in the, in the desert, and the whole generation, the whole first generation that should have been the great leaders to take them into the land of Canaan died off. And if you want to know more about the wrath of God and all that it involves, um, you can go to our web website, www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Go to um, the news and resources area. Go to look, at, look up Ellen White, and under that you'll find a thing called The Final End of Sin and Sinners. And in pages 31 to 40, there's a lot of information about God's wrath, some very interesting information. Well, wasn't about 300 years later, the children of Israel said, we're not happy to be under God's control. We want our own king, like all the other nations around us. And what happened when God chose that first king? Who, who, did, they cho who did he choose and why did he choose him? Saul. He chose Saul. Why? That's what they wanted. They wanted a real big, muscular guy who looked like a leader and so forth like that. Yeah. And we know that even within Saul's life, he went from, you know, God gave him a change of heart back at the beginning, and by the time he got to the end, what was he doing? Consulting the uh, spirit mediums. Spirits, Consulting yes. the spirit mediums, trying to get to contact Saul, uh, Samuel, and he went to uh, a lady who was supposedly able to bring Samuel up from the dead, which of course is crazy if you read right there, up from the dead, where, where, is, where are good people supposed to be, theoretically? You should have been bringing Samuel down, right? But it says right in the text, brought him up. Well, he says, he says, what do you see? He says to her, what do you see? And she says, I see Elohim's coming up. Yeah. That's in 1 Samuel 28, what, 13, something like that. Yeah. Well, of course, when David took over the kingdom, things were, looked good for a while. And in the first, first few years of Solomon's life, things looked really good. He built that glorious temple that was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. But in the process of doing that all and then trying to build up his own house and supporting 1,000, 700 wives and 300 concubines, I think it was, and all that kind of stuff, uh, things got really bad. It was hard on the people. And the Ellen White comments like this, the tribes had long suffered grievous wrongs under the oppressive measures of their former ruler. The extravagance of Solomon's reign during this apostasy had led him to tax the people heavily and to acquire of them much menial service. Prophets and Kings, page 88 and 89. So from that point on, it seems they could only rebel against the Lord. Um, Rehoboam lost, he, con he continued to just rule the southern part of the kingdom. Most of the tribes to the north rebelled against him. They went under, they decided that they would, would choose Jeroboam is their ruler instead. And uh, we look at that and we say, man, how could they be so crazy? What was going on there? Is it, was the devil really just incredibly more persuasive with his false religions than God was with the truth? Why were they so prone to go that way? Or were the Israelites maybe just incredibly poor at raising their children. 
and convincing them to follow the Lord. That's a question for the ages. Yeah, that's why I'm asking it. <laughs> well, God called them a stiff-necked people. Mm -hmm. You can put various meanings to that. You know, as I was kind of reading Jeremiah, I was thinking, you know, it's, um, and reflecting on the history, yeah. this is a sample mm -hmm. of the history, a very good example of the sample of the history. It's just the same thing. Um, it's the Garden of Eden all over again. Yeah. God says, do this, and you ignore it. And um, Why do we then, do that? Well, th that, that's what I say. That's the question of the ages. I'm not sure we, we, we have the real answer to that. It reminds me of that scenario where someone's in a tough spot in life and they, and they pray to God, bail me out this one time and I'll change my life around. Mm -hmm. And if they get bailed out, and usually it's not long until you're back into your old habits. So, Yeah. It's called selfishness. They used to, uh, not too long after World War II, that was, the common expression was foxhole conversions. Yes, <laughs> yes. So we still haven't answered why is that. Okay. I think in part people want to create their own God and have a sort of, they think they have a sort of quid pro quo, like I'll do this, you do that. When did Solomon build that thing to Moloch? At, toward the end of his life. Yeah, really, offering his children on mm. as sacrifices, mm. that's terrible. So what do you, we talked about uh, how they repeat, how they, in a generation, they would, they forgot this, mm. this uh, enlightenment that they had, and, and they've done that time after time. Why? You know, a, a new generation is brand new. They have to learn everything. I get mm -hmm. freshmen every year, and yeah. we have to teach the freshmen this not only the same algebra that we taught the freshmen <laughs> last year, we have to teach them some things about their conduct Yes. that freshmen are typically capable of doing, and then we've got sophomores and so forth, so how do you, I mean, if this is so much a, a part of uh, what we are, how, how do you, how do we, how do we bring to an end Number, first of all, you question why is it we're that way, and then number two, how do we bring it all to an end so that we aren't yeah. always falling into those? Well, let me ask maybe an even tougher question that we don't want to address very, very much. How successful have we been at convincing our own children to stay in the church and to be committed to it? The parents can't learn for the kids, but it's really difficult if the parents didn't learn and to, and to teach the kids, mm -hmm. and it's really... Here we are 170 years after the Great Disappointment. How long did the children of Israel wander in the desert? 40 years. Only 40 years. And now we are four t more than four times farther than those 40 years. And we criticize them for being so stiff-necked. Well, going back now to Jeroboam. Jeroboam was the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel. And what did he do just to make things more fun? Remember? He's, he said, uh, if my people go down to Jerusalem to worship at the temple like they have been, they may change their mind and decide not to, not to uh, stay with me. They may change their allegiance back to the kingdom of uh, the house of David. Mm -hmm. And so he built two golden calves and said, these are the gods that brought you out of Egypt. Now, let's think about that for a minute. Did everybody, and, and I had had the privilege not too long ago of actually visiting the northern site, the one in Dan, where, and, and it's still there. You can see it, and you can see the stuff that other kings later on added to that shrine. I have pictures of it. But now let's stop and think about this for a moment. The people who went to worship there, what did they see? They saw an altar, and what was on the altar? Golden bull calf. A golden bull calf. And the king says, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. And you would say, oh, of course, no <coughs> question about it. Right? Well, how many years before that was it with Aaron? Didn't he do the same yeah. thing? Yeah. Huh? When Moses was up on Mount Sinai. Yeah. 
Aaron, yes. it, 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 the people, all the people pressured me to do this, you know? Well, to, to, to think, I mean, it just, it boggles my mind to think that the king could stand up there in front of all those people and say, this is the God who brought you out of Egypt. Yeah, this gold bull calf caused the plagues. He came down on Mount Sinai. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So why did Jeroboam do the same thing that Aaron had done all those hundreds of years earlier? Well, obviously, all he cared about was what people thought of Jeroboam and his kingdom. He didn't care about anybody else. That was a start. Why wouldn't he come up with something else other than bull calves? Golden bull calves. I mean, that's. He, he would, you would have thought he would have learned from what happened to Aaron. Well, the, Ellen White says in Prophets and Kings, page 107, the apostasy introduced during Jeroboam's reign became more and more marked until finally it resulted in the utter ruin of the kingdom of Israel. That would be the northern kingdom. And I can tell you, if you look at the history of those kings, every one of them was down, 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 down until finally the whole nation was conquered by uh, the Assyrians in 723-722 BC, Shalmaneser and Sargon II, kings of Assyria, put an end to the country and scattered the inhabitants throughout their empire, and we have no way to trace them from that day to this. They disappeared into history. So if, if what we understand is correct, that they wanted a king, but God didn't particularly want them to have a king, but they wanted a king, so that's what he gave them. So ultimately, if they were to, to make a reversal here and head back to where they ought to be, then they would have, uh, they would have said, uh, enough of this king business, let's go back to yeah. like it was in the time of Samuel, which... Wouldn't that have been smart? Yeah, but it wasn't all that much better in his time either, you know, he had yeah. corruption in the temple and yeah. it doesn't seem to make any difference what kind of a... Yeah system well, you have. Let me read a few verses from 2 Kings 17 about what happened in those days. Samaria fell because the Israelites sinned against the Lord their God, who had rescued them from the king of Egypt and had led them out of Egypt. They worshipped other gods. I'll just follow the sequence here. They worshipped other gods, followed the customs of the people uh, whom the Lord had driven out as his people advanced, and adopted customs introduced by the kings of Israel. The Israelites did things that the Lord their God disapproved of. They built pagan places of worship in all their towns, from the smallest village to the largest city, on all the hills and under every shady tree. They put up stone pillars and images of the goddess Asherah, and they burnt incense on all the pagan altars, following the practice of the people whom the Lord had driven out of the land. They aroused the Lord's anger. We mentioned that back in in Judges 2 and 3, they aroused the Lord's anger, because what, what have they done? They've already turned away from God with all their wicked deeds and disobeyed the Lord's command not to worship idols. How does that sound like a wonderful progression? It just, you know, I read that passage and it just blows me away. So this capture of the northern kingdom in 722, 723, th that's the same time that Jerusalem was under siege? No, 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 no. Under Hezekiah? This, is, Hezekiah. this is the northern kingdom yeah. was, was besieged and destroyed by the Assyrians. Right. 720, 723, 722, because remember we're counting down, so 723 but comes isn't that when the 185,000 Assyrians were killed? That was, no, that was not. Uh, about 25 years later, 22 years later, 701, 700, somewhere right in there, that same group of Assyrians came down to Jerusalem and tried to conquer the southern kingdom. And in, in that case, we had, they had for temporarily had one, one of the two good kings. Well, there was a couple others that weren't too bad, but Hezekiah was king at that point in time. He went to Isaiah, they prayed together, they called the people together, they worshiped in the temple. And Hezekiah says, God, what should we do? And they went to bed, and that night the angel of the Lord came out and destroyed the entire Assyrian army. 185,000 of them were dead the next morning. So, so they, they retreated, of course, after that. There was nothing for them to do. The Assyrian army was wiped out. They never really attacked Jerusalem ever again. The 
the, the Babylonian problem we're going to talk about, about a little bit later in Judah happened in 605. That's almost 100 years later than the time that Hezekiah was attacked. And then 598, 597, he did it again. And then 587, he said, I'm finished with putting up with these rebellious people. He just flattened their thing, tore the temple down, left, left Jerusalem in total, total shambles. Okay. Well, it would be nice if we had time to read the rest of it. But if you read the rest of those verses down there, just amazing. I mean, all the way down to offering their own children to these pagan gods. Well, obviously the southern kingdom saw that happen to the northern kingdom and they learned the lesson, right? No? <laughs> they did not. <laughs> well, look at a couple of places. Look at Second Chronicles 33, 9 and 10, what happened. Manasseh led the people of Judah to commit even greater sins than those committed by the nations whom the Lord had driven out of the land as his people advanced. What's happening now? The children of Israel are behaving worse than the Canaanites did that they drove out. What's God supposed to do? Verse 10, although the Lord warned Manasseh and his people, they refused to listen. Did I hear someone making a comment? Well, there's other verses, um, and if you get our handouts, they're available online. Uh, all, the, all the documentation is there. During the times of those kings in both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, God sent multiple prophets to try to warn them of what was coming. We mentioned last week that at the time of Jeremiah, when the southern kingdom of Judah was finally collapsing, there were how many prophets? Remember? Seven, seven. seven of them. Seven prophets that we know by name. Prophet, and there may have been others that we don't know by name. They were prophesying, please reform, please straighten out, please, 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 please. Did it do any good? Nope. nope. Why is it that as one reads the stories of these two nations, people never seem to think for themselves? Have you noticed? If you read through this, what happens? The king was evil, and what did the people do? They follow. Follow his example. Finally, once in a while, a good king comes along, so what happens? They follow his example, so sometimes. Group think. Group think? Why? Well, coming now to Jeremiah 2. Uh, Jeremiah, look at Jeremiah 2. One, we'll read the first few verses there. The Lord told me, and that will be the God speaking to Jeremiah, to proclaim this message to everyone in Jerusalem. I remember how faithful you were when, we, when you were young, how you loved me when we were first married. You, fought, excuse me, you followed me through the desert, through a land that had not been sown. Israel, you belong to me alone. You were my sacred possession. When was it that they were so faithful? <laughs> you know, was just, that in the wilderness? I was just going to ask you that. When was that? Was that during the 40 years? Well, the only time I can think of was maybe while they were building the tabernacle to put a Mount Sinai. Probably the only time. So, Israel, you belong to me alone. You were my sacred possession. I sent suffering and disaster on everyone who hurt you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Listen to the Lord's message, you descendants of Jacob, you tribes of Israel. The Lord says, what accusation did your ancestors bring against me? What made them turn away from me? They worshipped worthless idols and became worthless themselves. How does that work? Think of you become, you become like what you... Uh, like what you, where you place your attentions and your affections. Yeah. And so if your idol is worthless, then you become worthless. Uh, but I mean, is that, is that just a figure of speech or what actually happens? Well, God had had enough. If you're worshiping a golden bull calf <laughs> and you're off somewhere and you go, you know, you go into your house and close the door, do you think the golden bull calf can see what you're doing? About as well because I can see when you're in its presence. <laughs> <laughs> That's also true. That's also true. But you know, if you if you if you have to pick it up and carry it around, you don't have to worry about what this God is going to do to you. 
Well, I don't know. That's what they used to do with the um, the Ark of the Covenant. They well, picked that up and carried it around. But if you touched it when you weren't supposed to, what happened? Well, and then in the early days, its essence came out when they moved it okay. and they followed it. So that's probably not the best illustration, but nevertheless, there's <laughs> a little bit of a... Well, look at one other verse. Jim. What we worship and admire, we become more and more like that. If we admire a, a golden bull calf, we become more and more like the character of that golden bull. Not so much shining and beautiful as hard Earthless. and impenetrable? As uh, hard-headed. Hard-headed, okay. Don't we have record, too, that the kings of those other countries understood that it was God that conquered that 185,000? Where were our people? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. For a short time, they paid attention. Yeah. There must be, uh, there, we must be overlooking in our discussion here that there are certain attributes that they contribute to, the, to those stone gods and there. Okay, we know that they think that they, the fertility gods control fertility and the right. rain gods controls the rain and so forth. And uh, well, so th there's got to be something about the character that we ascribe to those that we, we become. Okay, become let's more. think about this for a moment. If you believe that Baal is a storm god, the fertility god, and that if you worship him, he will send the rains. And so it's getting that time of year, so you're desperate for some rains and you want to plant your crops and you pray to, to, to Baal, and what happens? Pretty soon the rains come, and you think, hmm. Baal did it. Baal did it, right? Well, but if things don't come, then for some reason... Like there, in the days of Elijah, maybe. There is the inclination to believe, well, there must be something I am doing that's not noise. making him happy. Yeah. And so I must do something to make him happy, whatever we, whatever, whatever, whatever is ascribed to that behavior. They kill more innocent children. Yeah. Reading oh. further down in chapter 2, uh, verse 8, the priests did not ask, where is the Lord? My own priests did not know me. The rulers rebelled against me. The prophet spoke in the name of Baal and worshipped useless idols. I mean, where do you go from there? <clears throat> this might, um, um, how, how far off were we from today, though? This lesson seems, hearing everything that's from the beginning of this lesson till now, it seems so, the correlation seems so close to what, how we're living right now. Careful now, you've got the meddling. I uh, no. might not be safe, but... <laughs> are, you, are you talking about... Uh, you couldn't be talking about our generation. Our culture or other culture? Are you talking about us as individuals? Are you talking about yourself? What are you talking well, about? The, from <laughs> leaders to church to, I mean, it yeah. seems instead of Bell and God, we have turned to, you can provide with just yourself. And... Maybe nowadays, the you everything or you the need. government can bail you out, and mm -hmm. no, no focus on God. And if something's wrong in the world, it's um, someone else's problem. You so can look, look anywhere, at the world's history as we know it, and what we have record for humanity has got an ongoing bad record. Period. Not even us. You're not talking about us, right are you? Right down to us. Right down to us. Well, the nations are pictured as hopelessly attracted to foreign leaders and foreign gods. In the southern kingdom of Judah, the situation improved temporarily under Hezekiah and later briefly under Josiah, but very quickly the people reverted to even worse apostasy. Well, look, how do you understand these words? This is, I'm going to read verses 12 and 13. Um, well, actually, let's just do, limit ourselves to, number, to verse 13 of Jeremiah 2. For my people have committed two sins. They have turned away from me. And we said when they turn away from, from God, what does he do? If they persist in it long enough, he finally says, okay, go your own way. And we call that God's anger, right? They have turned away from me the spring of fresh water. And they have dug cisterns, cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. Now, I want you to think about this. Both the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, and that whole area 
is, in those days, was full of subsistence farmers. What's a subsistence farmer? Hand to mouth. He, he, he eats what he can grow at that point in time, and whether it's from his milk from his cows or vegetables from his farm or whatever, it's hand to mouth kind of situation. Okay, so what do you do during the long dry season? What do you do, how, where do you get water? Hopefully you've got a system full of it. Well, what they normally did is they collected rainwater, they would dig a hole in the ground, they would, they would line it with various kinds of stuff, usually plaster of some kind, and the hopeful, hope was that that plaster would stay solid and so you got this nice reservoir of water. What happens if the plaster cracks? Water. Leaks. You're in trouble, serious trouble. And guess what happens to all your water? Leaks out. So what is God trying to tell us by this metaphor? Not to put your faith in a cistern that <laughs> crack. Yeah. Not to worship worthless things. The word worthlessness there can also be translated vanity, vapor, even breath. How long does vapor and breath last? Oof. It's gone, poof, like that, huh? <coughs> And we've referred to this many times, but I need to read it one more time. This is Great Controversy, page 555. It is a law, both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature, that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. Man will never rise higher than his standard of purity or goodness or truth. If self is his loftiest ideal, he will never attain to anything more exalted. Rather, he will constantly sink lower and lower. The grace of God alone has power to exalt man. Left to himself, his course must inevitably be downward. Now that ought to scare us, right? I like John 4:14, 4, where it says, Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Mm -hmm. The water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Very good. Good, good. So that quote that you read from Ellen White, does that mean that if we are constantly reading the Bible that we will become more and more godly? That sounds like it, doesn't it? So it works both ways. Mm-hmm. Basically, here's what happens. Our minds, we, don't, we sort of don't see this impact, but if you think about it, what's your mind doing? Your mind is taking in stuff all the time, hearing, seeing, tasting, touching, uh, what am I smelling? It's taking in all those sensory things, and it's storing it. It's stored in there. And your character, your personality, what you think about and so forth, ends up being a conglomerate of that collective stuff that you put in there. So what happens? If you spend all your time watching movies and playing video games and so forth like that, what are you collecting in there? Rubbish. Rubbish. But if it's only just reading the Bible, I don't think that's all it is because oh, no, a lot no. of people read the Bible and that's why we have so many different religions and many people are reading the same Bible. It's how we interpret things too. I think if we need the Holy Spirit to help as well. Yeah, and you only get the right interpretation. Yeah. yeah, and you only get that, I think, with a real relationship with God. Absolutely, yeah. Well, look at Jeremiah 27. We're going to jump over a little bit. We find something very interesting here. Jeremiah 27, verse 6. I am the one, this is God speaking, I am the one who has placed all these nations under the power of my servant, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia. Who, what? Mm. Who's God's servant here? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar? Does that mean that Babylon was more faithful to God than Israel or Judah? Let's get this story straight here, folks. What does this tell us? <coughs> tells us that uh, God is willing to let uh, Israel or Judah go and when they continually reject him, and Nebuchadnezzar is the is the force that's around that's going to the destroy them. The instrument. It's not that God is inspiring Nebuchadnezzar or driving him. 
But God, God can no longer protect Israel and Judah when they're more wicked, we read a little moment ago, more wicked than the Canaanites that were driven out before them. They ins the, the people insist on leaving God, and mm -hmm. God in with his view for freedom says, mm -hmm. if you insist on leaving me, I'll let you go. Yeah. Well, let me just review the history very quickly. Earlier in history, Egypt had been the predominant power. As Egypt's power was waning, Assyria rose to be the dominant power. Then as Assyria was waning, Egypt sought to regain its dominance. And we're going to see how that impacts the history of Judah. However, at the famous Battle of Carchemish in 605 BC, Egypt was crushed and Babylon became the new world power. Almost immediately after the Carchemish battle, Nebuchadnezzar and his troops marched down into Judah and conquered it, carrying off Daniel and his friends. Nebuchadnezzar told Jehoiakim, then king of Judah, he placed him there, that if he would remain faithful and pay tribute, things would go well. But the citizens of Judah were not only rebellious against God, and Jehoiakim was not only rebellious against God, who told them to remain faithful to Babylon, but also they were rebellious against Babylon. And guess what happened? Two more conquests and two more sieges, and finally... Well, did God give them any kind of a warning about what he had planned, what was going to happen? Seven prophets were around somewhere. Yeah? Repeatedly. Do we know what they said? <clears throat> Clean up your act. Well, look at a couple of passages that we actually have recorded. Look at Jeremiah 28, verses 8 to 12. So then, because you would not listen to him, the Lord Almighty says, I am going to send for all the peoples from the north and for my servant, again notice this, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia. I'm going to bring them to fight against Judah and its inhabitants and against all the neighboring nations. Is that pretty clear? I'm going to destroy this nation and its neighbors and leave them in ruins forever, a terrible and shocking sight. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will silence their shouts of joy and gladness and the happy sounds of wedding feasts. They will have no oil for their lamps and there will be no more corn. This whole land will be left in ruins and will be a shocking sight. I told you, Jerusalem ended up being nothing but a pile of rubble. And the neighboring nations will serve the king of Babylon for how long? Seventy years. Seventy years. <clears throat> did they know? If they believed God, did they know what was going to come? And it was repeated. Look at, look at verse chapter... Yeah, go ahead. That was chapter 25, by the way. You said chapter 28. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Tw 20, yeah 20, 25. But look at chapter 29, verse 10. The Lord says, When Babylon's 70 years are over, I will show my concern for you and keep my, my promise to bring you back home. I alone know the plans I have for you plans to bring you prosperity and not disaster, plans to bring about the future for you, you hope for. Then you will call to me, you will come and pray to me, and I will answer you. You will seek me and you will find me because you will seek me with all your heart. When did that happen? To a few of them. Yeah. It happened to all of them. Just a few came back. Mm hmm well, but how many, how many of them actually got, came back and said, call on the name of the Lord, give our hearts completely to God? A couple. Yeah, not very many. And what, had hap what happened to those few who did come back and were faithful? God blessed them. How do we know that the people didn't believe, believe Jeremiah because somehow he did not have um, credibility? Well, he predicts that Babylon is going to come, and he's going to conquer the city. Babylon comes and conquers the city. I mean, do you need more credibility than that? But there's some other prophets that were prophesying other things. How did the people know not to believe those prophets? I think you're going to talk about that later. Yeah, yeah. there were some bad prophets. False prophets. Bad prophets. You mean that could happen? And that's the 28 that I want to talk about. We're going to talk about it a little bit later since you brought up. Let's look at it. Um, we have some of those in our own church, don't we? What? So how do we know which ones to... Okay, so Gordon, Jeremiah Gordon has just made his prophecy. That same year, in the fifth month of the fourth year that Zedekiah was king, now here you want to see if there's any evidence, 
Hananiah, son of Azar, a prophet from the town of Gibeon, spoke to me in the temple. Now, now this Hananiah is speaking to Jeremiah. In the presence of the priests and of the people, he told me that the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, had said, okay, I have broken the power of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I will bring back to this place all the temple treasures that King Nebuchadnezzar took to Babylonia. So until that doesn't come true in two years, how do they know that that's wrong? Well, I will also bring back the king of Judah, Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim, along with all the people of Judah who went into exile in Babylonia. Yes, I will break the power of the king of Babylonia. I, the Lord, have spoken. Well, okay. yeah, now, but he'd spoken in the past saying that we're going to have bees and hornets take care of our battles. We won't have to go out and fight anything. Well, aren't there, aren't there people who would say these kinds of... How do you decide? Do you, do you believe the one who shouts the loudest? <laughs> do you believe the one who looks maybe somehow more like he might be a real prophet? That's my question. Well, here's, here's a clue. Read on, a couple more verses. Then in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the temple, I said to Hananiah, wonderful, I hope the Lord will do this. I certainly hope he'll make your prophecy come true. I mean, wouldn't that be, everybody would want that. And we'll bring back from Babylon all the temple treasures and all the people who were taken away as prisoners. But listen to what I say to you and to the people. The prophets who spoke a long ago before my time and yours predicted that war, starvation, and disease would come to many nations and powerful kingdoms. But a prophet who predicts peace can only be recognized as a prophet who, whom the Lord has truly sent when that prophet's predictions come true. Then Han Hananiah took the yoke off my neck, broke it in pieces, and said, in the presence of all the people, the Lord has said that this is how he will break the yoke that King Nebuchadnezzar has put on the neck of all the nations, and he will do it with this within two years, repeating his prophecy. Then I left. Sometime after this, the Lord told me to go to say to Hananiah, the Lord has said that you may be able to break a wooden yoke, but you, he will replace it with an iron yoke. The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, has sent has said that he will put an iron yoke on all these nations and that they will serve King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia. The Lord has said that he will make even the wild animals serve Nebuchadnezzar. Then I told Hananiah this and added, Listen, Hananiah, the Lord did not send you, and you are making th these people believe a lie. And so the Lord himself says that he is going to get rid of you. Before this year is over, you will die because you have told the people to rebel against the Lord. And Hananiah died in the seventh month of that, seventh month of that year. Was, Would that be a clue? Was Hananiah deliberately trying to just be a bad person, or did he think he had the right idea? He wanted to be the big shining prophet that predicts the wonderful events that are going to come. He was, he was trying to win favor with the people. Do we have evidence that he was a true prophet at some time in the past? No. So now you're standing, you're one of the people standing by there, okay? All of us are standing there. We heard Jeremiah, we heard Hananiah's comments, we heard Jeremiah's comments. Which one would you like to believe? Hananiah. No question. So what do you think, who do you think they believed? Well, Hananiah is more in line with what they believe about Israel. God's going to protect Israel. He's going to take care of Israel. They're going to be... Okay, so your wife, let's just take for example, let's say your wife was there and she hears all this and you're home uh, that particular day and she comes home and says, guess what? Hananiah just died. Now what are you going to say? Oops. <laughs> <laughs> We've known he's been sick a long time. Yeah. <laughs> but does a prediction necessarily, is a prediction necessarily false because the one that makes it dies? I mean. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah didn't live for another 70 years, did he? No. Or to no. keep from wandering too far was, did God cause his death, mm -hmm. or God just could see because of his foreknowledge that that's what was going to happen? Well, but the point is, the person who has a connection to God should be the one who can tell you the truth, right? So he says, Hananiah, you're going to die within this year. So, what are we all going to do? We're going to stand around, we're going to watch, see what happens to Hananiah, right? Probably scared him to death. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe so, but it came true, didn't it? it did. Shouldn't you say, hmm? 
So Jeremiah must know what he's talking about. But at the time, how do you know? That's that's the question. You wait and see what happens. Well, can't well, how do you wait? Know, how do you know today? Yeah. I can't. I can't wait two years to find out if Hananiah is right okay. or wrong. Uh, well, okay. but but what what um, if they had followed Hananiah's mm -hmm. uh, a counsel? Mm -hmm. How would how would they have responded? Would they have taken up arms and gone to war? Or would they just wait for it to come to be? It sounds oh. like that it didn't make any difference what Hananiah said. Had they followed with what, if they believed what he said, eventually it wouldn't have come true. And 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 no matter what what he said, their response would have made no difference anyway at all. If I'm understanding, I'm not, I'm not sure I follow you. Well, what did Jeremiah he, is standing Jer he, Jeremiah is he saying, says look, 70 years. Jer Jeremiah is saying, doom is coming here, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. What was Hananiah saying? No, it isn't coming. He's saying, he's saying the people who have already been taken into captivity are coming back. The king of Neb Babylonia is going to fall. The king is going to, Babylon is going to lose its power. All, that, all our wealth and everything is going to be returned. Well, eventually that happened. Not exactly. They came back with a little bit, not much. Well, <clears throat> look at Jeremiah 5, 2 and 3. Even though you claim to worship the Lord, you do not mean what you say. This is God talking to the people. Surely the Lord looks for faithfulness. He struck you, but you paid no attention. He crossed you, but you refused to listen. You were stubborn, excuse me, you were stubborn and would not turn from your sins. What do we do in a case like that? What is God supposed to do? Had things really deteriorated to the point where God could not find a single person in Jerusalem who wanted to do what was right? Well, even if they had, would it have made any difference? Could they have reversed this? Yeah. I, I can just tell you, and I'm, I'm cheated because I've, I've read a little bit ahead, we're going to get to the end of the story that in, in, in preparation for the third time when Nebuchadnezzar came and finally ended up just completely destroying everything to, burning the temple, burning everything down, just leaving Jerusalem in a pile of rubble. And just before that happened, the king, Zedekiah himself, called Jeremiah secretly. And he said, okay, tell me, because obviously the king knew at that point in time what the situation was. He could, I mean, Babylon has been surrounding the city for three years or something like that already. He could see where things were headed, okay? So he said to Jeremiah, okay, tell me the truth. So Jeremiah says, okay, if you will just march out through the gate and surrender to the king of Babylon, you'll be fine. And the temple will be fine. And the city will not be destroyed, and the temple will not be destroyed. And Zedekiah says, but what will people think of me? Anyway, we'll get to that. Well, look at Jeremiah 7, 4. I mean, the story is getting worse and worse. God says, stop believing those deceitful words. Now, he, let's, let's talk about this. Jim, you want to say something about this? It's one of your favorite passages. Wh which one? Jeremiah 7, 4, 3 and 4. No, it's 7, 22. I, I, oh, I well, started about verse 16 is where I, where I take it. Yeah, okay. Well, let me, let me just... It's all good. I mean, uh, yeah. Look, let, let's start with verse 1. Jeremiah 7, starting with verse 1. The Lord sent me to the gate of the temple where the people of Judah went in to worship. He told me to stand there and announce what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, had to say to them. Change the way you are living and the things you are doing, and I will let you go on living here. Okay, there's another. That's the Lord himself speaking. Folks, speaking through Jeremiah. He's saying, if you just change, I will let you go on living here. Stop believing those deceitful words. We are safe. This is the Lord's temple. This is the Lord's temple. This is the Lord's temple. So what were they doing? What was happening there? He said, since this is God's temple mm -hmm. and his city, God won't let it be destroyed. Mm -hmm. We are safe as long as we're here. Yeah. Surely God won't allow anything to happen to this beautiful temple here in Jerusalem. Right? Wow. Wrong. Well, Jeremiah goes on and yes. tells them what they need Starting to do. At verse 5, uh, go, yeah. go ahead. what they're doing. Comment. For if you truly amend your ways and your doings, if you truly execute justice one with another, mm -hmm. if you do not oppress the alien, 
the fatherless or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, if you do not go after other gods to your own hurt, then I will let you dwell in this place in the land that I have, that I gave the old, excuse me, gave of old to your fathers forever. Now, this is what God wants them to stop doing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but he's saying that, that it's, um, you go after God to your own hurt. In other words, when they do something wrong, it's themselves that suffers. And, yeah. we'll, and we'll get more of that as you go on through, the, through that chapter. It's uh, not that God doesn't like what you're doing, so he zaps you. No. Go. You just destroy yourself by doing all these evil things. If we jump up to about verse 16. As for you, do not pray for this people, or lift up cry or prayer for them, and do not intercede with me, for I do not hear you. I thought we're, God hears our prayers. Mm -hmm. okay? Do you not see what they are doing in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, the fathers kindle fire, the women knead dough, dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven, and they pour out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger. Mm -hmm. But it is I whom they provoke, says the Lord, is it not themselves to their own confusion? Yeah. The point being, Sin is self-destructive, not what it does to God. God's infinite. Let me, let me read what it says here in my Good News Bible. Mm -hmm. But am I really the one they are hurting? We're looking at uh, Jeremiah 7, and I'm reading verse 19. But am I really the one they are hurting? No, they are hurting themselves and bringing shame on themselves. And so I, the Sovereign Lord, will pour out my fierce anger on this temple. What is that again? My I'm going to back off. My wrath, no. I'm going to let them, just let them have what they've chosen for themselves. I will pour it out on people and animals alike, and even on the trees and the crops. My anger will be like a fire that no one can put out. And God doesn't have to lift a finger. He just okay. lets, lets the natural course of things go. And if you're bent on going, He will ultimately let you go. Well, we as the Seventh-day Adventist Church have been enormously blessed by God. We not only had pioneers who carefully and prayerfully studied the Bible with one goal of making sure they were following the truths in the Bible as they established their new church, but we also have the wonderful advice and counsel of Ellen White to guide us. But are we making the same mistake that the ancient Israelites did? If you read Judges 17.6 and 21.25, it says, what happened in those terrible days? Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. What does that mean? They weren't taking instruction from God, that's for sure. Your own, do whatever you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody today does that kind of stuff, right? That's not a lot different than what the story is in Judges, and this is how many years later? Yeah. Are we living up to God's plan for us? Are we giving up our selfish ways? Are we saying, yeah, I want to do really what God wants me to do? As we're starting to study the book of Jeremiah, do you think the people of Judah in his day actually thought they were doing what was right? Well, as you re review all that history, you think, um, and wh wh what about the history? Look at the history of our church. What can we learn from doing all of that by reviewing all that history? How do you think God felt about the people of Israel and Judah disappointing him time and uh, time again? What do you think God would say about the Seventh-day Adventist church today? if we had a Jeremiah in our midst? How did we treat the prophet that we did have in our midst? We sent him halfway around the world. Yeah. We sent her off. <laughs> Penal colony. <laughs> <laughs> You're home <man. laughs> Okay, well, here's some encouraging words, but they, they have a hook in them. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. She first said that in a letter she sent to the General Conference uh, to be read at the General Conference in 1893. It was repeated a number of times after that. I'm not going to give all the references. The problem with this passage is that it's not the leading of God that has caused us problems, but what? Our failure to follow God's leadings. Wow. Well, if you look at ancient Israel and you look at one of, the, one of the kings who was really wicked was Omri. He was the father of Ahab. He was really wicked. And God in the Bible just diverts a, devotes a few verses to him. 
But if you look at the, nation, the rec records from the other nations around those ancient things, you look at what's called the Misha study and the Black Obelisk, 150 years later, they were still calling the Northern Kingdom the land of Omri. So that should tell us that God judges differently than human beings judge. We sometimes suggest that Ellen White is our spiritual leader. Is that still true? Or are we following different leaders in our day, just as the children of Israel did? Well, at least we're not sacrificing our children to pagan gods, at least, right? Well, finally, in the days of Isaiah and Jeremiah, the rebellion of God's people was described as if they were playing the harlot and becoming prostitutes. They were acting very shamefully, even described. This is God himself describing his favorite people, described as going around naked. Is that supposed to be a good thing? Going around naked? <laughs> so to some people. <laughs> some people think it's a good thing, I guess. Well, look at Jeremiah 2, 27. Actually, I'm going to start with 26. The Lord says, Just as a thief is disgraced when caught, so all you people of Israel will be disgraced, your kings and officials, your priests and prophets, you will all be disgraced, you that say that a tree is your father and that a rock is your mother. I mean, Is that the idols? Yeah, these are the idols. Yeah. How do you communicate what, what, to a people what, at that level? Yeah, what, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> what does it take to make, to make someone do something like that? Do we go to the bank and say, we don't worship the bank, do we? Or the new car we just bought, or the... So what does this part of Jeremiah tell us about God? Well, it's pretty clear that God will go to extraordinary lengths to try to reach out to his people. I think that's great. But it's also true that he doesn't reach out when people turn against him and turn against him and turn against him. Finally, he says, okay, have it your way and suffer the consequences that you have chosen for yourself. And that's what we see here happening to the children of Israel, to the, to the nation of Israel, to the nation of Judah uh, in the days of Jeremiah. And I, poor Jeremiah, imagine living through three sieges, three sieges where people are eating their children. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the privilege of learning about you from these experiences that Jeremiah tells us about. It almost turns our stomach just to think about it. Help us now as we study these books, we study these chapters together, this experience together, that we may learn not to make these mistakes ourselves is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.